G'day everyone and welcome back to our paranormal world. Thank you so much for being here. In this video, we're going to have a look at one of the most fascinating and compelling cases of ghost sightings in modern history, the ghosts of Flight 401. This is not your classic ghost story. There are no castles, no old time ghosts in period clothes, and no possessions. But like so many ghost stories, this one begins with a tragedy. On December 29, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed into the Florida Everglades at around 11.40 p.m. The aircraft itself was the celebrated and much-loved Lockheed L-1011, which Eastern Airlines had nicknamed the Whisper Liner due to it having engines quieter than other jetliners. Passengers and crew all loved these planes. They were state-of-the-art in 1972 and roomy and very comfortable for passengers. Flight 401 boarded at JFK Airport in New York, and while the flight crew had arrived to begin the pre-flight checks, the cabin crew had been delayed in their arrival on an incoming flight. A standby cabin crew was assigned to prepare the cabin for the flight, and this crew included a flight attendant who, two weeks prior, while working a flight from JFK to Orlando, had a vision of an L-1011 crashing into the Everglades. In her vision, she saw the plane approach Miami International. It was late at night. She saw the left wing crumple and the plane smash into the ground. She heard the cries of the injured. Overwhelmed by her vision, she had to stop working and sit down. Two of her friends and colleagues asked her what was wrong and she told them what she'd seen. She also told them she'd had visions like this before and that they'd been accurate. Four former classmates had been killed in a rail crossing accident, which she had also foreseen. They asked her when this particular accident was going to happen and she told them around the holidays, closer to New Year, I think. Fearfully, they asked, is this going to be us? But she said, no, but it will be close. The originally scheduled cabin crew arrived in time to board flight 401 and the standby crew left the airplane. At that time, no one thought about the flight attendant's premonition from two weeks earlier, but they certainly did later and the friends she'd told verified her story. 401's flight into Florida was routine and smooth. The flight crew, Captain Bob Loft, First Officer Albert Stockstill, and Second Officer Don Repo were joined in the cockpit by Eastern Airlines Technical Officer Angelo Donadio, who was returning to Miami from an assignment in New York and was off duty. Nothing was out of the ordinary until at about 11.30 p.m. when the plane began its approach into Miami International. After lowering the landing gear, Officer Stockstill noticed the landing gear indicator light, a green light which would indicate the landing gear was locked and in position, hadn't illuminated. Attempts to cycle the landing gear still failed to get a confirmation light. Captain Bob Loft told the tower that they had an issue with the indicator light and would discontinue their approach, circling around and entering a holding pattern while they rectified the issue. The tower instructed them to hold at 2,000 feet. The crew all thought this was probably a problem with the light itself. And while First Officer Stockstill attempted to remove the light assembly, Second Officer Don Repo went into the avionics bay beneath the flight deck, which the crew called the hell hole due to the cramped space, to check manually if the landing gear was in position. After reaching their assigned altitude, Captain Loft 
placed the aircraft on autopilot while the crew tried to resolve the issue of the landing gear. Unknown to the pilots, as they hadn't been informed of this in their training on the aircraft, a slight bump to the controls would take the plane out of autopilot, and it is surmised that this is what happened. The plane began a gradual descent, which none of the flight crew noticed over the impenetrable blackness of the Everglades below. An altitude warning sounded in the cabin. However, this sounded in the speaker next to Don Repos station, and he was below deck when it sounded. The altitude warning was a half second C chord chime, and it was barely perceptible to the crash investigation staff who later reviewed the flight deck voice recordings, and they were listening for it. None of the flight crew heard this chime. Don Repo came back on deck and reported that he couldn't see if the landing gear was in position because there was no light in the hellhole. The light switch for this avionics bay was actually located above the captain's console rather than at the entrance of the bay. Had the light switch been located at the bay entrance, Don Repo would have been able to see that the landing gear was indeed in the correct position. Officer Donadio elected to assist Don Repo back down in the hellhole to check the gear. The plane was still losing altitude, but at such a slow rate that no one, not even the flight attendants or the passengers, noticed. The air traffic controller did notice the altitude reading was low on his radar, but false readings sometimes occurred, so he waited for another three sweeps of the radar to confirm before he'd alert the pilots. Captain Loft and Officer Stockstill were convinced the issue with the landing gear was simply the bulb, and they announced to the tower that they were starting to turn onto 180 for their approach. Officer Stockstill noticed the altitude moments prior to the crash, and from the evidence, it seems the pilots made an effort to correct it, but it was too late. With the aircraft in mid-turn, the left wing tip hit the ground and the aircraft smashed into the swampland, breaking up as it went. The first person to reach the crash site was a local airboat pilot, Bud Marquise, who was hunting frogs in the area and witnessed the crash. The plane, lying in muddy water, wasn't on fire and only the cries of the survivors guided him to the crash site in the dark. His helmet, equipped with a light for spotting frogs in the swampy waters, is what enabled the first rescue helicopter to locate the wreck in the dark. Bud Marquise spent the rest of the night locating and shuttling survivors out of the crash zone on his airboat. He later received humanitarian and hero awards for his efforts that night. Incredibly, there were 75 survivors of the crash, including eight of the 10 flight attendants. The survivors had injuries which ranged from minor right through to serious. First Officer Stockstill was killed on impact. Captain Bob Loft was alive in the cockpit when the first Coast Guard rescue helicopter arrived, but he died before he could be removed from the wreckage. Second Officer Don Repo and Officer Donadio were still in the hellhole when the plane crashed. Don Repo was airlifted to hospital, but died the following day from his injuries. Officer Donadio, incredibly, survived the crash and made a full recovery. The subsequent inquiry found that the cause of the crash had been human error due to their being distracted by the issue of the landing gear light. However, it was also found that several improvements could be made to the safety of the aircraft, any and all of which would have resulted in a safe landing that night.
the light to the avionics bay was relocated to be positioned near the landing gear observation port. The altitude warning was upgraded to include a flashing light and a louder tone. And the tower control protocols for warning pilots of altitude errors were reviewed and upgraded. And while those involved in the crash and their families would continue to struggle with the impact on their lives, the events in the following two years ensured the crash remained in the forefront of the minds of the staff of Eastern Airlines. Several reports from mechanics and stores workers claimed that Eastern Airlines had salvaged workable, non-structural parts from the ill-fated Flight 401 and reused them in other L1011s. Parts such as radios and avionics equipment, as well as the elevator to the galley area and food warming ovens. In particular, these parts were said to have been installed on aircraft number 318. About three months after flight 401 crashed, two flight attendants separately felt a cold presence in the galley area in the belly of 318. Both ladies had considerable amounts of in-flight experience and were also very happy to be working on the L1011s. However, on this one flight, both reported feeling as though they were not alone in the food preparation area and fled up to the cabin. On a flight the following week, one of these same flight attendants saw, again in the galley area, a white misty ball about the size of an orange form alongside a bulkhead. As she watched, this mist grew in size to roughly the size of a basketball and began to take on facial features, including a pair of glasses. And while she instinctively felt the source of her experiences held no malice, she still fled the galley area in fear. Other flight attendants had similar experiences and some flatly refused to work in the galley confines. They reported it had a creepy feeling and others identified inexplicable temperature drops in an area where if any change should be noticeable, it should be a rise in temperature from the ovens heating food. Later, something more shocking occurred. Aircraft number 318 was boarding for a flight to Newark and in the first class section, the flight attendant was making a routine head count. She realised the count was out by one passenger. Going back over the seats, she found the reason for the discrepancy. There was an Eastern captain in uniform in one of the seats. It wasn't unusual for Eastern flight staff to utilise unfilled seats for a journey home from an assignment, and mostly they would use the jump seat in the cockpit after being seated in first class for takeoff. It was referred to as deadheading. However, she hadn't been informed that there was a captain deadheading on this flight. She needed to confirm this, so she approached the captain with her list in hand. Excuse me, captain, she said, but are you jump seat riding on this trip? I don't have you on my list. The captain didn't respond. He simply stared straight ahead. I beg your pardon, Captain, she repeated. I need to check you off as either a jump seat or a first class rider. Can you help me? Again, the captain gave no response, but simply continued to stare straight ahead. Puzzled, she called the flight supervisor over, who couldn't gain the attention of the man either. They reported that he seemed perfectly normal in all aspects, except that it seemed he was in a daze. It was concerning for both of them, so they went to call the flight captain to see if he could speak with the man and get a response from him. There were half a dozen passengers in the vicinity of the deadhead captain, and the flight captain was perplexed as there wasn't a record of a jump seat occupant for that flight. 
The flight attendant and the supervisor accompanied him back to the seated captain. But as he leaned in to speak with the man, the flight captain froze. Oh my God, he said, it's Bob Loft. Then, in the silence of the cabin, something happened that no one could explain. The captain in the first class seat simply vanished. He was there one moment and gone the next. The flight captain returned to operations in the airport and the plane was searched. There was a long delay. The missing captain couldn't be found anywhere. Finally, with a passenger count checked and correct, plane 318 taxied down the runway for takeoff. This story spread like wildfire across Eastern Airlines and other carriers. In another report, the vice president of Eastern Airlines pre-boarded a plane prior to the regular passengers. He entered the first class section, which was empty except for a captain in an Eastern uniform. He stopped by the captain and said hello, before he realised that this was Bob Loft the deceased captain of Flight 401. After he realised this was Loft, the captain suddenly vanished. Again, a complete search was made of the plane and no sign could be found. No deadhead pilot was listed to travel on that flight. Captain Loft was seen again by a flight captain and two flight attendants who spoke with him and then he disappeared. That particular flight was cancelled. On a flight from New York to Miami, a flight attendant opened the compartment door to the overhead lockers during a pre-flight check in the first class cabin, only to find the face of Captain Loft staring out at her from the compartment. The flight attendant had known Captain Loft and flown with him several times before the crash of Flight 401. One particularly interesting story involves a passenger in the first class section of a New York to Miami flight. The plane was still at the ramp and the head count had not yet been taken. The passenger was seated next to an Eastern flight officer in uniform. Something about the officer seemed wrong to the woman. He appeared pale and unwell and when she spoke to him, he didn't respond. She asked him if he was okay and should she call the flight attendant to help him, but still there was no response from the man. Disturbed, the woman called the flight attendant, who agreed that the flight officer did seem unwell. During this exchange, several other passengers noticed what was going on and then, in front of the flight attendant and the passengers, this flight officer, who the attendant identified as an engineer, simply disappeared. Everyone was disconcerted. However, the woman seated next to him became nearly hysterical. Upon arrival in Miami, she insisted she be shown photos of Eastern flight engineers so she could identify the man. Both she and the flight attendant identified Don Repos as the man in the seat next to hers. One Eastern captain told the story of being warned by a flight engineer in the jump seat of an electrical failure. The captain ordered a recheck and a faulty circuit was identified and repaired. Later, that jump seat engineer was identified as Don Repos. On a flight to Mexico City on plane 318, a flight attendant who had known Don Repo personally and also heard the stories of his appearances on the flights, saw the reflection of the flight engineer in the oven door in the galley. She immediately exited the galley via the elevator to the passenger cabin, where she grabbed the first flight attendant she could to accompany her back down into the galley. The second attendant also saw the image of Don Repo in the oven door and they called the flight deck and asked the engineer to come down to the galley. He too saw Don Repo's face, clearly formed and he too recognised him. In addition to this however, Don Repo spoke to the engineer saying, watch out for fire on this airplane and then 
disappeared completely. The plane landed in Mexico City without incident, but when the engines were turned over for the continuation of the flight to Acapulco, the number three engine wouldn't start. A ferry crew were dispatched to return the plane to Miami for repairs. The L-1011 could easily take off and land on only two engines, but the repair to the third engine had to be done to return the plane to passenger service. As the plane took off for the ferry trip to Miami for repair, the number one engine stalled and backfired several times. The captain quickly discharged the carbon dioxide fire agent to prevent the engine from bursting into flames. The captain had to climb to an altitude high enough to enable to turn back to the runway and land on only one engine. This particular story was published in the Flight Safety Foundation newsletter. On yet another flight from New York to Miami, on the approach to Miami International, a male voice came over the PA system and gave the customary address to fasten seat belts and extinguish cigarettes in preparation to land. No one in the plane's crew had made that announcement and the PA system wasn't in use at the time. A flight attendant in the galley on a flight to Miami saw the face of second officer Don Repo reflected in the galley oven door. Caterers were loading food trays onto plane 318 and made a sudden exit, refusing to re-enter the plane. They reported seeing a flight engineer in the galley who disappeared before their eyes. On plane 318, during a flight from Atlanta to Miami, the second officer sitting at the engineer's panel heard a loud knocking coming from the compartment below the cockpit down in the hell hole. He went to the trap door in the floor and with a flashlight scanned the whole area, but found nothing unusual. The compartment was empty. As he rose and turned back to the engineer's panel, he clearly saw the face of Don Repo, whom he had known well. On another flight, the engineer came to the flight deck prior to doing a walk around pre-flight check. He saw a man in an Eastern Second Officer's uniform sitting in his seat at the panel. He recognised him as Don Repo. The apparition of Repo said, you don't need to worry about the pre-flight, I've already done it. And almost immediately, the three-dimensional solid figure of Don Repo vanished. A flight attendant in the lower galley reported an overloaded circuit in one of the ovens. A man in an engineer's uniform appeared within moments and fixed the oven. Shortly after, another flight engineer arrived asking what was wrong with the oven. She told him it had already been fixed by another engineer. He insisted he was the only engineer on this flight. Later, she looked up Don Repo's picture and stated that this was the man who had fixed the oven. Another captain reported an encounter with Don Repo, who told him there will never be another crash of an L-1011. We will not let it happen. But pilots, passengers and flight attendants weren't the only Eastern crew to experience the odd phenomena. Mechanics reported strange electrical anomalies of apparatus operating when there was no power to the plane during maintenance. And one mechanic reported being handed a screwdriver by an unseen hand, and he ran from the plane in fright. But most reports suggested that the apparitions of Don Repo and Bob Loft were helpful and not in any way harmful, but rather having the safety of the flight as their main reason for being there. Many commentators on the stories of the ghosts of Flight 401 proposed that Repo and Loft were so horrified and perhaps guilt-ridden in death for the ill-fated Flight 401 that they couldn't rest without trying to ensure the safety of the aircraft they later visited. What is compelling about these stories 
is they were witnessed by people with no real reason to make up such a story. Passengers who had never laid eyes on either loft or repo, and captains and flight officers whose professionalism and credibility were not in question. And the sightings were not of wispy, nebulous or amorphous apparitions. These were solid looking figures in full uniform who appeared to be real people in seats right up until the moment they disappeared. Eastern Airlines themselves were dismissive of the reports and went to great lengths to quash the whole thing. It was widely known amongst the staff that talking about what they had seen would land them in hot water with their employer. Those who reported apparitions and experiences in the early days of the occurrences were referred to psychologists to make assessments of their mental health. Later, staff refused to go on record with their stories in fear of losing their jobs. Easton's official line was that the whole thing was garbage and simply a case of the rumour mill inspired by some overactive minds. Interestingly, the phenomena of the apparitions of Don Repo and Bob Loft seemed to last only for a period of around 18 months. And it is around this time that stores people and mechanics reported that perfectly well functioning components of the planes were being swapped out and replaced on the 318 and other planes. Of course, there is no official record of these being the recycled pieces of Flight 401. However, many credible sources believed this to be the case. In 1976, investigative journalist John G. Fuller wrote The Ghost of Flight 401 after researching all he could about the true reports of this extraordinary case. And in 1978, a movie based on the book by John G. Fuller was released and it starred Ernest Borgnine. After the release of the book and the movie, Easton considered suing for libel based on assertions of a cover-up by the airline and the belief that the ghost sightings were prompted by the components salvaged from the wreckage. Ultimately, Easton chose not to pursue the matter legally, believing it would simply give more publicity to the book. An original floorboard from Flight 401 remains in the archives at History Miami in South Florida and Ed and Lorraine Warren's Occult History Museum also holds pieces of the wreckage. In a 1980 book from Robert J. Sterling, From the Captain to the Colonel, An Informal History of Eastern Airlines, the claim that components of Flight 401 were reused on other active aircraft is refuted. And he says no Eastern employee ever claimed to have seen or even believed in the ghost sightings. And skeptic Brian Dunning claims that the origin for the ghost stories was a joke made by a captain after an emergency landing, where he says the captain quipped, Don Repose ghost was on the plane. Bob Loft's widow and children did sue John G. Fuller for infringement of Loft's right of publicity, invasion of privacy, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. However, that lawsuit was dismissed, and later the dismissal was upheld in a court of appeal. And this very unclassical ghost story, set in the modern era, continues to captivate the imaginations of people everywhere. Eastern Airlines ceased operation in 1991, suffering from significant financial difficulties and an increase in competition from No Frills Airlines. Memorials to the tragic accident have been conducted, including some of the crash survivors and the Southern Airboat Group. And that is the story of the ghosts of Flight 401. I do hope you enjoyed it.
Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to make sure you get all the notifications of the paranormal content. I'll see you next time.